Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Photographs in the Archive, Digitizing Your Photographic Collections. I have just a few housekeeping notes to mention. If you have any sound or technical issues today, please let us know in the chat box with a direct message, and I'll do my best to help you out. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording, along with a PDF version of the slideshow, will be sent out to all registrants within the next week or so. And finally, we do have some built-in time at the end to answer any questions that may come up, but please feel free to type them into the chat box at any point throughout the presentation. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to share a little bit about the Documentary Heritage Preservation Services for New York. DIPSNY, as we like to call it, is a collaboration between the New York State Archives and the New York State Library with services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. DIPSNY is a statewide program that provides free planning and education services to support the vast network of collecting institutions, such as archives, libraries, historical societies, museums, and other organizations that safeguard and ensure access to New York's historical records and library research materials. DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation and condition surveys, strategic planning assistance, and access to a variety of educational programs, such as this webinar. To learn more about our services, please visit dhpsny.org. And with that, I pass this along to today's presenter, Maggie Downing, Manager of Digital Imaging at CCAHA. Great, thank you, Leah. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in this afternoon. Um, I'm excited to talk to you all about um, how to address some of the unique challenges in digitizing um, photographic collections. Um, as Leah mentioned, I'm the manager of digital imaging at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, or CCAHA. We are a nonprofit conservation lab and preservation services facility. Um, our, conserva our, our conservators specialize in the treatment of paper-based items, uh, which include books, photographs, archival materials, artwork, and other works on paper and our preservation services staff work in the field, um, presenting education programs and helping institutions plan for the future of their collections. Um, CCAHA also offers digitization services, which I lead, as well as fundraising assistance, housing and framing services, and more. Um, we are based in Philadelphia, but we work with organizations and clients all across the country. Um, so if you want to learn more about what we do, you can visit our website uh, linked at the top there at ccaha.org. So just to give a quick overview of today's talk, um, I'll start with a brief discussion of how to determine file specifications, like file type, resolution, and color profiles for different types of photographic materials. Um, I'll discuss some different equipment options for digitization and then give some tips for approaching different types of challenging photographic materials, um, starting with bound albums and scrapbooks. I'll also talk about negatives and transparencies, cased images like daguerreotypes or tintypes, and panoramic prints. So first, I want to discuss um, a few different documents that provide standards and recommendations for digitizing different types of collection materials. Um, these are published by several organizations, including the American Library Association, the National Archives and Records Administration, and the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, or FADGI. Um, each of these provides guidance on determining file specifications, such as file types, um, which can include TIFFs, JPEGs, and PDFs, which are most common um, in digitizing uh, image collections. Um, resolution, which means the amount of detail that you capture in an image. The bit depth, which is the depth of pixel information available in your image and color space, which is the standard organization or gamut of colors available in your image. Um, I'll discuss more of these in, in the next couple of slides, but I, I also discuss this a little bit more in depth in episode three of a Digitization 101 web series um, on file specifications. So if you're interested in learning more about these specific terms, um, you can go ahead and check that out. Um, the different standards that I listed here on the right of the slide, these are all useful in different ways. 
Um, so the ALA guidelines at the top, these are nice because they have pictures they are well illustrated where others are not. Um, the NARA guidelines are helpful in that they discuss workflows beyond um, just the, the digital captures. They include guidelines on metadata, creation, and quality control. Um, but today I'll be focusing on the FAGI guidelines for digitizing cultural heritage materials. Um, that's because these are the most recently updated of the three. They're used by some government institutions. Um, and the information in these guidelines is a pretty good reference point for determining file specifications. So the FEGI document um, can be intimidating. It's pretty long, um, but the bulk of it is made up of recommendations for each different type of material. So there's a lot of redundancy in the document itself. Um, it includes recommendations on, on all types of um, still images, including bound volumes, documents that are in general or special collections, oversized materials, newspapers, prints and photographs, transparencies and negatives, um, paintings, x-ray film, and microfilm. And while there's a lot to this document, um, the part that's most useful for our discussion today is the recommended performance levels um, in, for each type of material. So the performance levels, these are laid out in quick guide tables throughout the document um, that outline most of the file specifications I just talked about, including file format, resolution, bit depth, color space, and color. So these tables uh, outline recommendations on a quality level of one to four stars. Um, so for digitization projects where you're trying to create faithful reproductions of original collection materials or digital surrogates, uh, I recommend only looking at the three and four star recommendations. So on this slide, I've included an example of performance level tables for prints and photographs, as well as photographic transparencies that are 35 millimeters up to four by five inches. So as you can see in these tables, TIFF is recommended across the board as the file format for a master image file. Um, TIFFs are uncompressed file formats, and these are really ideal for long-term preservation. But access file formats can be in pretty much any format you like. Uh, most commonly for images are um, file formats like JPEGs, PDFs, and PNG files. Um, JPEG is probably the most common in image collections. But the main difference between these two tables is in the resolution recommendations. Um, so for the smaller transparent materials, the FAGI document recommends digitizing at at least 3,000 or 4,000 pixels per inch, um, or PPI. So this is so you can zoom in and see the finer details of the image, whereas in a photographic print, they, might not they don't typically contain that same level of detail. Um, so once you can view the grain of a photographic image, a higher resolution doesn't gain you much more in terms of information, it just makes your file size larger. Um, so for prints, 400 PPI or 600 PPI is typically sufficient. Um, but if you do have very fine detail in your images, um, if you're working with aerial photography, for example, you may wanna digitize even higher than that, maybe 800 or 1000. Um, so I recommend this document, the FAGI document for, um, looking for recommendations on file specifications for digitization. Um, but just keep in mind, these are recommendations. You can be adapted um, based on your own collection and institutional needs. Um, so I wanted to pause here for just a minute. I'm gonna next turn to talking about um, equipment options for digitization, just to see if there's any questions on file specifications that I can address now. I see one question in the chat, how do I set bit depth? Um, that would be in the, the file processing for a raw image workflow. And for um, if you're working with a flatbed scanner or scanning equipment, um, that would be set in the scanning software. So it's typically either 24-bit or 48-bit is the, is the difference. 
and it looks like um, closed captioning has been enabled. All right, see a few more questions here. Um, how can we ensure the color of the digitized file is as close to that of the original? I'll talk about that, um, color profiling and, and calibration targets with the equipment discussion next. And then there's a question about how many megapixels is in 400 PPI. It really depends on the size of the original and the, um, the, the, the bit depth and the color. So all of that is going to affect it, um, but these are, are typically pretty large files. I'll have a few software recommendations, um, but if, for more of that, I recommend the um, equipment selection episode of the Digitization 101 series. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that next. Um, and if you want some more, we can uh, give you some resources for further learning. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. I do see I got a couple of questions about equipment, so I'm just going to jump into that next bit of the presentation. Um, so there's a couple different options that you have for digitization. Uh, most common are digital cameras and flatbed scanners. Um, but there's also a range of specialty scanners, um, including dedicated book scanners, film scanners, and oversized scanners. And I'll talk about each of these in the next few slides. Um, and again, equipment selection is something I discuss more in depth in an episode of Digitization 101. So that, that's linked here, and we'll send these out um, with, the slide, with the PDF of the slides. And there's also an episode I gave on setting up a studio with a camera and a copy stand. Um, so both of those can be resources for, for more on that. Um, so first I wanna talk about digital cameras for digitization. These are super versatile, can be used to capture many different types of materials. Um, a lot of advantages here. One is that the capture is pretty much instantaneous, which can provide a very quick workflow. Um, the equipment also doesn't come in contact with the object. So it's suitable for a lot of three-dimensional or fragile materials that might not work on a flatbed scanner. Um, but there's a lot of components um, to this setup, a lot more, I guess, than, than a flatbed scanner. So there's a little bit more of a learning curve in this setup. Um, but first you have two lights. Typically those are angled at 45 degrees to the object. You aim them just a little bit past the center of the object. Your lighting can be strobes, which is what is shown here in the top image, or continuous LED lights. Um, but either way, the most important is to have a consistent color output. Um, typically, photography studio lights are daylight balanced, um, but your most important concern is consistency. So it's you're getting the same um, light quality from image to image. Um, try to avoid in using hot lamps, uh, which increase the temperature in the studio space. And it's not great to have that fluctuation in temperature. They can also be kind of dangerous to handle depending on how hot they get. Um, the next you have your digital camera. Um, I recommend working with this tethered directly to a computer um, or working over Wi-Fi. That way you can control the focus, the camera settings and the shutter all from the computer. So you don't have to touch the camera or look through it to see what your images would look like. Um, the higher resolution camera you can get, the higher resolution you can get out of your images in a single capture. Um, and then the camera is mounted to a sturdy studio stand and pointed directly down on a table. So the one shown up at the top, um, this is a motorized copy stand, so it can move up and down very easily. It also has measurement markings on it, so we can set it at specific heights. Um, these are very convenient features, but they're not a requirement um, in digitization. Your main concern is that it's, it's sturdy and, and stable. The base here is a table. It can be any table, as long as it's, again, stable and can be level. And to the right and the image on the top, you can see there's different types of background boards that we use um, based on different client needs and material needs. So you'll need a background color that should be neutral, either white, black, or gray, um, just so it doesn't affect how you perceive the color in the final image. 
um, calibration targets like color charts are also very important components. I have a couple of examples here on the bottom of the slide. Um, these are targets that you photograph with the camera system as you set it up, and then you can calibrate for white balance and color accuracy. Um, the golden thread target at right also ca um, calibrates and checks for correct resolution, focus, lens distortion, and other metrics. Um, and then additional components shown here are two different ways of, of using a book cradle. These are pretty useful for bound objects. Um, they work to gently press pages flat without stressing bindings. Um, so especially for larger books with have a lot of dimension, um, these are helpful for keeping pages in the same distance from the camera as you move through the book. So you can maintain a one-to-one -one ratio of the original object in the image files. Now, flatbed scanners um, are also very useful tools in digitization. Um, you can set them up pretty much anywhere. And you don't need to control the light in the room um, or the digitization space. And all you need is a scanner, a computer, scanning software, and film holders if you'll be using those. Um, for software, I recommend a program like Silverfast AI, which comes with a set of color targets so you can calibrate your scanner um, before each session. Um, these are a bit easier to use, um, but they are slower in scan time than a digital camera setup. Um, they're also more limited. You shouldn't use them with oversized items that don't fit on the scan bed um, with any three-dimensional items or bound items or anything that's very fragile or delicate because you need to place it on the glass and, and press it with a lid. So you don't wanna damage anything. Um, but they are really great for, for smaller photographic prints and for transparent materials. Um, and it, they're really great options for, again, for, for transparent materials, especially if you don't have a camera um, that has a high enough resolution to capture at, or if you don't have the correct lens to get close enough to the object. Um, you can usually get a good high resolution scan and just one scan pass. Um, if you're looking for a scanner, be sure to get something that's intended for high quality photo scanning. There's a lot of things on the market that are kind of like all in one printer scanner machines. And these aren't going to give you the right quality that you want in a digitization project. So there's also a number of specialty scanners that are available for um, spe specific material types, including oversized scanners, um, film scanners and overhead book scanners. Um, but generally I recommend, unless you have a large and growing collection of these um, specific material types, I recommend using other equipment um, or outsourcing batches of challenging images like oversized blueprints um, or large batches of film, things like that. Um, but in general, working with something that's a little bit more versatile, like a flatbed scanner or a digital camera system, um, will give you a little more bang for your buck <laughs> in that sense. Um, so I'll pause again here before I get into the last part of the presentation, which is talking about challenges and specific types of um, collection materials. So I'll just pause here on to see if there's questions on equipment. There is a question on what lens to recommend for a camera. Um, I recommend using a fixed focal length lens um, and that something that doesn't um, change in, in focal length as you have it face down, because a lot of times the weight um, putting it face down can, can pull it out of focus. And yes, there are ways to scan photo negatives into positive images, and I'll touch on that in the next section. Documents versus photographs, um, it's pretty similar. Um, the resolution for a document is typically 300 or 400 pixels per inch, and photographs are, photographic prints anyway, are usually 400 to 600. But the I recommend checking out the FAGI document for specific types of materials. Um, I see a question. Do you recommend particular home scanners that are better for serious photo digitization? 
Um, I've noticed that HP makes good scanners, but their scanning plates are shrinking. And some of the newer software for home doesn't allow for TIFF exports. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with HP. I, I do work with Epson myself. Um, and I, if you do work with an HP scanner and you're happy with the scan quality, a third party scanning software might um, allow you to work, work with a TIFF. So I'm going to move along and then I can answer any other questions on equipment um, and when we have time at the end. Okay, um, so now I want to turn to some of the types of challenges we find in photographic collections. And I want to start with bound albums and scrapbooks. Um, so these are complex three-dimensional objects. Um, they should be digitized with a digital camera or overhead scanner rather than a flatbed scanner. And when you're handling albums or scrapbooks, um, typically clean bare hands are okay um, for touching the pages. But if there's loose photographic elements or the photographs uh, go to the edge of the page, it's important to wear gloves, um, nitrile gloves while handling. That way you can avoid transferring any fingerprints to the photograph. And a spatula can also be a helpful tool in turning pages or flipping loose items. If your album doesn't open easily to 180 degrees, you may need to support it at an angle and image just one page at a time. So shown here um, at right is an example of how that might look. Um, this is not a scrapbook, but it was a very complex um, artist book. So I have one side supported with an adjustable cradle and the other side is in plane with the camera. And then this, this setup, setup kind of shifts and changes um, to adjust the support of the volume as I moved through it. Um, in cases like these, we would image one side at a time and then the other side. But if you have a budget and space for this, you can also invest in a two camera system, which allows for imaging um, both sides of a bound volume at the same time. There's an example of that in the center. You can also consider disbinding a volume for digitization if it's simple and safe to do so. Um, be sure to consult a conservator before proceeding with this. They may point out some unseen issues um, with disbinding. But this is an example of a scrapbook that had a post binding up on the top right. Um, it was bound with a piece of string. The string was in good condition. It wasn't fraying. Um, so after consulting with the client and a conservator, we felt we could untie it for imaging and then retie it um, at the end without causing damage. So first we collated all the pages um, in order. So just if something happened, they got shuffled out of order, we would know the correct way to put them back. Um, then we documented the knot in the string so we knew exactly how to retie it. Um, so this is an important step. Don't skip that part if you'll be disbinding. Um, so after imaging, we were able to retie it in the same fashion. Um, so disbound, it was much easier to handle. There's an example of a page from that album just below it. Um, fold outs and inserts were a lot easier to manipulate than if it was still in its bound state. Um, but this, this one we did rebind on the, on the right, but you could also consider keeping a scrapbook in a disbound state and storing the leaves and folders either in groups or individually. Um, and seen there is an example at the bottom. Um, this is an example from a grant supported project that we recently completed on a collection of Count Basie family scrapbooks um, that belong to the Institute of Jazz Studies at Rutgers University. Um, I've used a few more examples from this project throughout this presentation. So there's no standard in making this decision of whether to keep scrapbooks bound or to disbind them, um, but it should involve input from both curators and conservators when making those decisions. A few more tips on handling scrapbooks. Um, you'll, typically want to crop to show the full page with a small border and use a neutral background, either white, um, black, or gray. And when dealing with scrapbook elements, it can again be helpful to work with a, a spatula to lift materials to reveal underlying elements. And then you can also employ um, small weights 
um, to hold back items during capture. So you can see in the image at the right, um, there's a clear piece of acrylic that's being used to hold the program open. You can also use um, poly strips or monofilament strapping to kind of restrain elements. It's a little more finicky to work with, but a little less intrusive in the final image. Now, aside from handling, there are some other obvious challenges in digitizing scrapbooks and elements. Um, there's all kinds of idiosyncrasies found in scrapbook collections. Um, and I want to credit Shannon Willis and Marsha McIntosh, who presented a talk on this topic um, called The Perils of Complexity, a multi-stage study to determine necessary images for digitized scrapbook representation. Um, they gave this talk at the Visual Resources Association conference in March 2021. And for this study, um, Shannon and Marsha first reviewed national trends in scrapbook digitization by studying digitized images on the Digital Public Library of America. And they found a really wide range of practices with no real consensus in approach. Um, so then they conducted user studies for direct feedback on different preferences. Um, you can find their whole presentation and script on the University of North Texas Digital Library website. Um, it's a really excellent summary of a lot of issues found in scrapbooks. And I'll talk about a few of the things that they discussed over the next few slides, um, specifically focusing on issues that we come across most frequently here at the Conservation Center. So some familiar elements that you may come across in scrapbooks are elements that unfold, um, such as this page from the Count Basie family scrapbook with a series of birthday cards. Each of them had messages in them. Um, and in their study, Shannon and Marsha concluded that a cropped version is not needed for simple fold out items. Um, in the example here with the newspaper clippings, they did find there was a slight preference to crop into each article on the page, in which case the fold out, um, you would also crop if you were doing that. Another common element is booklets or more complex multi-page elements that unfold. This example here is also from a Count Basie family scrapbook. Um, and you can see there's, uh, we zoomed into the multi-page um, program there. Uh, Shannon and Marsha found there was a preference among their study group to um, crop in on multi-page booklets for easier reading. Items and envelopes are also a challenge to represent. And they found that participants like to see a capture of the envelope on the page and the enclosed item also on the page rather than imaged on its own to show that the, in the context that it came out of the envelope and is not just a loose item within the book. Now, loose items are also very common. Um, again, this is a, a example from a Count Basie family scrapbook that had a lot of loose items tucked in the front cover of the book. Um, we find this is really common in scrapbooks we encounter. It might be items that the creator might have intended to attach to the pages and, and didn't get to. And in their study, Shannon and Marcia showed there was a slight preference to show loose items separately rather than on top of the page, but in sequence and labeled as though to indicate that they appeared loose on that page. So I really loved how this study considered a lot of different elements, a lot even more than what I've just discussed here. Um, they found very little consistency in practice, and really their, in their direct um, study, they did not show really an overwhelming present preference for any specific method. A lot of their findings showed about a 60-40 split in preference, so their findings um, shouldn't be thought of as prescriptive. Um, but it's important to think about all of these elements and create a consistent workflow when you're working with scrapbooks and albums and complex bound um, objects like this. So now I want to talk about negatives and transparencies. Um, these have their own challenges in digitization. When you're working with negatives, always wear gloves and handle them at the edges. Um, film attracts dust and fingerprints super easily. So it's important to handle them very carefully and minimally. 
If you notice any flaking or warping or that your film is sticking into sleeves, um, be sure to consult a conservator before proceeding because handling these for digitization may cause more damage. If you have glass negatives, but they're in original boxes and paper sleeves, um, also consult a conservator. There can be a lot of unseen issues in collections like these. Um, negatives should be reviewed, then treated if necessary, cleaned and rehoused um, before handling for digitization. So these should be, digitization should be the last step. But if your negatives are in good condition, um, there's a few different equipment options. Uh, flatbed scanners can be really good tools for digitizing negatives um, because negatives are typically small and flat, so they're perfect. <laughs> um, and flatbed scanners, again, can obtain high resolutions in just one scan. A digital camera is also a great option. Um, if you're using a digital camera, you would photograph your negatives over a light box. So just as in selecting photography studio lighting, it's important to select a, a light box that has a consistent light output and color temperature with no vignetting on the edges and one that doesn't get hot during use. You definitely don't wanna work with something where you're raising the temperature um, significantly of the objects you're trying to digitize. There's also a lot of film, dedicated film scanners on the market that can do faster scans than a flatbed scanner. Um, I haven't really seen much either, seen anything really rise to the top in terms of reviews that I've done, um, but it, it can be an efficient way to approach a large film collection. Um, so I would just recommend um, if you're interested in something like this, then work, uh, read some reviews and work with something that has a return policy. And that way you can um, test it, make sure you're getting the image quality that you need um, before you commit to it. These can be kind of limited in, in what they can scan. They can scan typically standard sizes of slides and film, but if you have irregular um, sheets of film, it might not work with a, with a dedicated film scanner. Also important to point out, avoid any type of scanner that has an automatic feed. Um, this can really damage your um, material. So, and don't be the lady in the lower left where she is using her bare hands to feed a strip of negatives through the scanner. If you have mounted images um, that have information on the mount, a digital camera is really ideal here because you can capture both the information on the mount and the, the image um, in just one capture. So to do this, you would measure an exposure for the slide over the light box. That's typically longer, usually um, for us around a quarter of a second, depending on how bright the light box is. And during that same exposure, you would also light the slide with normal reflected light. Um, so if you have strobes, you can work with them. Um, but if you don't, if you're using continuous light, you would just want to drop the exposure down a little bit so it doesn't overexpose the mount while you're um, capturing the slide image over the light box. When you're working with negatives, um, and again, we had a question like this in, um, to this question in the chat. Um, your goal is probably to get a positive image. So it's important to do that on a copy of the negative. So during a digitization project, you wanna scan the negative itself with little or no adjustments at all. Um, you wanna create as faithful a reproduction as possible to serve as your preservation master copy. Then you can make a copy of the negative file to create a positive image. Um, and you do that by inverting the colors. Um, that's a... Uh, a tool in Photoshop, and you can also do it by just inverting the, the curve in an image editing software. Um, and on the positive image, you can feel free to adjust levels and color and contrast so that the image looks good. But it's important to keep in mind that these are very subjective adjustments that you're making. It doesn't mean that that's what the photographer themselves would have done, or if they even would have selected to print from that negative in the first place. Um, inverting color negatives is even trickier um, because color negatives have an orange cast to them. 
Um, this isn't something you can standardize because each type of film has a different um, kind of tint to it and each roll of film um, is processed differently in a lab. So each roll of film is basically unique. Um, so again, this is a very subjective process. Uh, I've linked to a few articles and videos that outline approaches to creating positives from color negatives. Um, the challenge in creating positive images from color negatives is removing that orange cast. So if you have a white or neutral gray point in your image, you can use that to white balance off of that. Uh, and it, this, again, this is a very time consuming process, but once you get some settings down, you can create some presets um, and apply them in batch. So that way you can only need to make tweaks in each image as you go through them. So next I wanna talk about cased images and reflective images. Um, these can be daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and tintypes. Um, again, I recommend using a digital camera to digitize these. Um, so you don't have to put them face down on a scanner. These are usually housed in a case with a piece of cover glass on top, which can cause issues with the glare and reflection, especially when you have your camera close to the object, you often get a reflection of the lens, which you don't want. Um, since these are typically pretty small items, it's helpful to capture at a higher resolution than your typical photos and prints, photographic prints. Um, ideally something around 1200 ppi or higher. Um, that way you get can zoom in on that fine detail. Glare can be reduced by using a large lens board. Um, shown here is one that we use at the Conservation Center. This is made of a very, very super lightweight foam board and it's covered in a thin black velvet paper. So it's very black, absorbs a lot of light. And then this is placed over the um, lens of the camera and held in place with the lens hood. So we have the camera very close to the object that we're digitizing there, um, but we don't have any glare um, or reflection of the camera lens in the resulting image. And the last challenging uh, material type I wanted to discuss is panoramic prints. Um, these are often found in collections as well. And again, a digital camera is recommended over a flatbed scanner, mostly because these are typically longer than the, long, like the largest scan bed. If your prints are stored rolled, like on the top image here, do not unroll them yourself. Um, it can be very tempting, but if they're, especially if they're very tightly rolled, um, it, if you unroll them on your own, it can cause the emulsion to crack and mess up your image. But if you consult a conservator, they should be able to humidify the print and unroll it without causing any damage to the image. Um, so here are some examples of prints that had been stored rolled um, from the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame and Museum of the American Cowboy. Um, these were unrolled and then digitized with the digital camera. Um, and you may find that even after your prints have been flattened, there's still a little bit of curve on the edges. So this can be reduced with um, using clear acrylic weights along the edges, um, or if you work in a facility that has a suction table, you can photograph that as like your copy stand table. Um, so that in these images, that's what we did. We, these are actually photographed on a suction table, which is holding the print flat during imaging. So there's no curving on the edges. Depending on the size of the panorama, you may wanna shoot them in multiple sections to maintain the desired resolution and then stitch them together in an image editing program like Photoshop. So to sum up, um, I, we discussed the file specifications for different types of materials using the FAGI document as a guide. Um, talked about different equipment options for digitization um, and specific challenges in photographic collections, including bound albums and scrapbooks, negatives and transparencies, cased images and panoramas. And with that, I wanted to spend some time with some questions here. All right, we already have quite a few questions in the chat. Great. 
we're just going to jump right in. Okay, great. Um, is an automatic feed option okay if you're scanning a batch of standard 8.5 by 11 office papers? Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't recommend them. Um, just because there's a, a high a high risk of something jamming um, and damaging your documents. So if these are are collection items, I don't I don't recommend it. If you're working with just office documents that are not part of a, a permanent collection, but just kind of like working documents, they're probably okay. But just know that that is a risk, no matter what type of automatic feed thing you're using, it can jam and damage or destroy a page that you're working with. Next question, why would you invert colors? So that would be um, when you're making a positive from a negative. Um, so that the, inverting the, the colors is the quickest way to, to turn that negative into a positive. Um, and then you can adjust contrast um, and, and, and the exposure from there as well. What is a suction table? <laughs> Great question, and I wish I, I I wished I had put an image on the slide. Um, a suction table is a uh, kind of a mesh surface table that um, it, it's a common tool in conservation. So it might not be in a lot of um, collecting institutions, but if you work with a conservator, they they may be able to, to help you out. But it, it provides it provides sucks air through the mesh, um, so it kind of sucks things flat um, and can suck. Um, dirt and, and moisture out of, of materials, which is what it's used for in conservation. But for us, we use we adapted it. So it just we used it to keep the object flat. Is there a difference between using a camera or a scanner in the end result? Um, in the final TIFF file, not ex no. Um, that you may there's there's different levels of of detail that you get depending on the scanner model or the camera that you're using. The biggest difference is in workflow um, and in um, and the material types that each type of machine can handle. Uh, but if you're looking at from a TIFF that has been taken with a camera versus a scanner, both very high quality, um, there's not really a difference. Um, and really quickly, I just want to reiterate, because it seems some folks might have joined us a little bit late, uh, the recording of this webinar, as well as a PDF version of this slideshow, will be sent out to all registrants within the next week or so. Um, and so the next question for you, Maggie, is how would you handle 3D objects in scrapbooks, such as coins? Um, I would, <clears throat> with a coin, while they are three-dimensional, that the information is basically two sided. Um, so I would, I would approach that and just photograph it unless there's information along the edges that you want to capture, um, then I might recommend capturing that by itself and and kind of getting different angles like you would photograph a, a sculpture essentially. But if it's a coin that's just attached to a scrapbook page, I would just photograph it as though it were a normal attachment. Regarding glass plate negatives, um, we have a lot. Are there any specialty companies who will digitize them or can it be done in office? Um, it can be done. I mean, it's something that the Conservation Center handles a lot, um, typically because there is a conservation component to it. Um, but these can be done if you're if they are in good condition, in proper housing and clean. Um, they can be digitized um, carefully by using a, a digital camera or a flatbed scanner. Um, if you're using a flatbed scanner, um, be sure to be very careful in how you lift the glass negatives off of it because it can scratch the glass. Um, and again, use gloves while handling them, handle along the edges. Um, and I, I'll just always reiterate again, um, there's a lot of unseen there can be a lot of unseen issues in glass negatives. So if it's a collection like I had on the slide, 
where it's in an original box, original paper sleeves, I definitely recommend having um, a conservator look at that before proceeding with, with digitization. And I see a, a chat just came in. Be, if shipping glass plate negatives, beware. <laughs> that is a good point. There are um, resources and recommendations for how to best ship glass negatives um, for, for packing them. And then um, they should be kind of in, the, in a specific direction on the truck to avoid um, cracking and breaking. But yes, that, it's a, definitely something you want to be careful with if you'll be outsourcing that. What do you use for digital storage for the future? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and this, there is also a, an episode on file storage in the Digitization 101 series. Um, but the, the short version is to have, the best idea is to have a, what we call 3-2-1 backup strategy. So that's having three copies of your data on two different types of media with one in a different location. Um, so you can use uh, network servers, cloud storage, um, hard drives, all of those are, are options, but you want to have a variety of, of copies. When digitizing a scrapbook with photographs glued in, would you ever recommend moving the photograph to record any information written on the back? If they're glued in, that can be tricky. Um, you'd probably destroy the backing um, material, the, the page that they're on. Um, so that, I mean, that's a curatorial decision, I think. Um, if it's important, if you think there's very important information on the back of the photograph, then that might be a, a worthwhile trade-off to basically take the photograph off of the page that it's glued to. Also just curious to hear your thoughts on image colorization of digital copies of historic images. Just, my, just general thoughts. Um, I think it's I think it's very cool. Uh, it's all, I mean it is pretty subjective again, but um, it can really bring things to life and engage people in in different ways. How much money should I allow in my budget for a serviceable digital camera? Um, <laughs> can I follow up on that on on an email? Absolutely. I can give some some recommendations. Um, on different different types of cameras. It, it can range up to tens of thousands of dollars, um, but I can I can give a couple options. Um, yeah, I will send you uh, Christine's email from her registration so you can follow up. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, your opinion of places like Legacy Box. Um, I'm not sure of, I think Legacy Box is, is a company where you can ship materials to and they digitize it, but I, I'm not, I don't have experience with them. So I, I apologize, I don't, I don't have much of an opinion. Can you recommend a brand of suction table? Oh, that, <laughs> I'll ask our colleagues here and I, I'll follow up again on email for that. <laughs> they'll, they'll have a good, um, the conservators here will have a good recommendation. I'm seeing a couple other questions come in about um, digital camera cost. So I might um, put together something to share with the whole group when, with the rest of the resources. Okay. That sounds fine. We can include that in that email with the PDF and the link to the recording. Great. Um, how can we faithfully create a particular type of digital print from a digitized negative? For instance, creating digital print from a digital album print copy made from a wet collagen negative, how can we prevent alteration of the color tint at all the stages? So um, having a, a color calibration target um, and calibrating all of your equipment at the beginning of the imaging session um, sh would will go a long way in um, color faithful color representation. Now, getting that to a print, there's another step. So you're you're communicating that to a printer, um, 
which isn't always as as straightforward though there are specific color profiles you can get it very close um, but when we do photo um, facsimile printing here at the conservation center we typically have the object out um, and and look at it together with the facsimile print so we may tweak color a little bit on a copy file so that we get the correct um, printer output um, but there's no magic bullet because there's a lot of different components that are talking to each other with different technologies. Um, so there's no one one size fits all um, solution for accurate pr color printing. How do you handle storing and managing digital files for long term preservation versus access? Oh, yeah, so that can be so TIFF files for long the long term preservation of master files. Um, those are very large files typically, and you may want to keep them in a dark storage, um, which can be cheaper, um, where you don't have as immediate access to it. And then JPEGs, PDFs, PNGs, you can keep in a more of a like more active archive. Um, but I recommend working with, um, if you have work with an IT consultant or have an IT department with your institution, talk to them about the different options um, and levels of access that you would need. Um, but a lot of times, um, high res master files can be kept that are in a way that are less accessible than, than your lower resolution JPEGs. Can you recommend any microdentials slash online courses that teach about photo scanning and photo editing? Oh, um, yeah, I think Lyricis has some good um, webinars. Um, also, they, there's a lot on, on YouTube, really. Um, and the, then the um, Dipsney webinars have a few other digitization um, webinars and, and the Conservation Center as well. Do you have suggestions for color calibration targets? Are they worth buying or are there, sorry, the chat is moving very quickly. <laughs> are they worth buying or are there free slash low cost options out there? So yes, there's the, the golden thread targets um, that I mentioned earlier in this presentation. Those are pretty expensive and they work with an expensive software as well. Um, that's going to give you the kind of top of the line calibration um, that you can test for the the FAGI levels. Um, and those, I mean, the, the the targets range. And then we also, I also linked to one called the x right Color Checker Passport. Um, that's used specifically just for color calibration and exposure, measuring for correct exposure. That goes a really long way. Um, in creating consistent images. And that's a lot less expensive than, than the golden thread targets. Um, I don't recommend anything that's that's super cheap or free because you want it to be high quality, um, but then you, you can use it for, for years once you have it. What is the best way to digitize tintypes and daguerreotypes for exhibit? Would like to get an image about eight by 10. Okay, um, working with a digital camera and trying to get you know as close to the object as possible, get as much resolution as you can. Um, so, for example, in the image images that I showed, we digitized those at about um, two thousand pixels per inch, so we could blow those up pretty big. And that was just done with a thirty-five millimeter digital camera. Thoughts on TIFF versus JPEG 2000? Um, so JPEG 2000 is, um, it's it's a version of, of JPEG that I believe is, is recommended for a master file in some cases um, by the Library of Congress. Um, I don't typically recommend it because it's not as widely adopted in it, like not as many programs can open it as can with TIFFs and JPEGs. Um, so while it might be a stable file format, um, I worry that it hasn't been as widely adopted um, and that it might, it might cause issues with software rendering that file later on. 
Can you recommend an affordable book cradle camera setup for a public library that might not utilize it frequently? Our primary interest is digitizing our own scrapbooks. Yeah, um, I'm gonna make a note of that. I do have a recommendation, so I'll follow up on that um, on email. Best way to convert a TIFF document into a PDF that is not a huge file size. Um, yes, we do that a lot. And the trick is to create JPEGs first. Um, so and make your make a PDF from a J, the JPEGs. Um, you can also do this in a program called Adobe Bridge. And from that, you can set your um, desired resolution, the, file, the page size, um, and you can make a PDF through, through Bridge with a little bit more control over the, uh, the vinyl file size. Um, but usually we work with JPEGs to create a PDF. Can you say something about filling out metadata for archival reference? Oh, um, <laughs> so that's gonna depend on your metadata, your own kind of strategies for metadata and requirements there. Um, you can embed a lot of different types of descriptive metadata using software programs. Um, we would use at the Conservation Center, we use Adobe Bridge to, to do that. Um, but you can also, you don't have to embed uh, metadata. You can just have that stored in a, a spreadsheet or in a collections management software and just link to that based on file name. Um, and then again, there's an episode of the Digitization 101 series on metadata. So that I go a little bit more in depth on that there. And it looks like we have a follow-up um, just asking if you could let everyone know about the affordable book cradle. So yes. we'll include yeah. that information. Yeah. I'll put that on the like the equipment list. Perfect. So yes, everyone, please expect a <laughs> huge email from info at dhpsny.org that will have the recording, a PDF of the slideshow, and many, many resources for you and recommendations for Maggie. Um, and it looks like this is the end of the questions we have. Um, let's just give it like a second in case folks are still typing. Um, but I just wanted to thank you all for joining us today. And if you enjoyed this webinar and would like to join us for future programs, you can find a list of all of our upcoming um, educational programs at dhpsny.org forward slash education. So thank you, Maggie, for such a great presentation. It's looking like that was the end of our questions. Um, and I hope you'll have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all.